was done just with, with whatever kind of materials they could find. So they tied with a lot of carpet fibers and all their weight. They would basically strip old, old phone cables and stuff to get copper wire for waiting. So, you know, they had a pretty tough um, set of uh, conditions to work with and, and equipment. And so, but regardless, um, they developed this kind of style of uh, back then, because they didn't have fly lines and a lot of stuff, they just basically have a fixed amount of leader. Or... That was Devin Olson talking about the history of Euro nymphing. This one is jam packed with info, so let's get into it. This is episode number 43 of the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Uh, before I get into it, I uh, just wanted to ask you to please subscribe and leave a comment if you have an idea for a Season 3. Just go to wetflyswing.com slash subscribe if you've been enjoying the podcast. In today's episode, I interviewed Devin Olson, one of the leaders in Euro Niffing in the U.S., Devin has been on the USA national team for 12 years and breaks it all down today. We talk about the history of Euro nymphing and why it's so effective in the U.S., cover tips on setting up your leader, why short tippets are key, and get into a little on the Provo River. We also talk about a bunch of nymphing ticks, uh, attempts, get into Devin's go-to patterns, and the best rod uh, to use for Euro nymphing. Don't miss this as Devin breaks down why presentation is the most important thing in nymphing and why many fly fishermen struggle and get it wrong. We have some tips to remedy that today. Before I get into the episode today, I wanted to thank our sponsors. Ascent Fly Fishing has customized fly box selections they put together for your unique stream. These aren't just flies in a box, but they analyze the insect community, do a summary, and provide you with the exact patterns that are in your stream when you are ready to fish. Go to AscentFlyFishing.com and grab your custom fly pattern selection today. That's A-S-C-E-N-T FlyFishing.com. We are also supported by the original tie right, which holds flies and hooks securely so you can tie on your fly with little effort. The original tie right senior holds hook sizes 2 through 14, and the tie right junior holds hook sizes 14 up to 24. The tie right can help tie clinch knots, modify clinch knots, and many other knots to suit your needs. So head over to tyright.com and grab the original tie right today. That's T Y dash R I T E dot com. So without further ado, here's Devin Olson from tacticalflyfisher.com. How's it going, Devin? Fine, thanks, Dave. Great, great to great to have you on the show. Um, we've been talking a little bit. Uh, I can't even remember exactly where I I tracked you down from. I've been connected with so many people, you know, over the the year here. Um, I'm not even quite sure, but I was hoping to dig into a lot of the Euro nymphing um, kind of information and your background and how you got into that whole thing and how. You know, basically the the U.S. the the kind of the the, the fishing team and that whole process. But um, maybe before we get into all that, you could tell us how you got into fly fishing and 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 then how you move that into kind of where you're at today. All right. Well, uh, you know, I was a I was lucky. I had a dad who introduced me to fly fishing when I was a little kid. Um, in fact, my parents have a picture of me when I was 18 months old holding up a, a fish that I'd caught on on some bait but uh <laughs> uh so i i fished as a you know a young kid kind of throughout uh, my early years and got into fly fishing when i was nine and i would say probably by about the time i was 11 i was pretty serious about it mm-hmm. and it just kind of took off from there yeah so you got into fly fishing uh so at what age did you actually start tossing the fly nine. Oh, at nine okay wow mm-hmm. yeah that's definitely early and and so at, at, at nine, how did you get from there to, I'm not even totally familiar with how the whole process was as far as competitive fishing. Maybe you could describe how you go from the nine-year-old into uh, kind of when you got into that. All right. Well, I got, you know, I've always been a bit of a competitive person. Um, and I, if I take something up, I like to go full bore on it, and which is why I don't do a whole lot of things in life. And the few things that I do, I try and do well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and... Um, 
So 2004, uh, there was a, a reality TV show that used to be on the Outdoor Life Network called The Fly Fishing Masters. Hmm. And um, I, I watched it in 2003. Um, and actually, there was a couple of local guys, uh, Ryan Barnes and Lance uh, Egan, that <clears throat> were in it. And I can't remember if they won that year or if it was later when they won. But anyway, um, I got really interested in, in that because it was uh, an opportunity to compete in fly fishing, which was something I was very, very serious about uh, by that point. And uh, so I went to the regional tournament they had up in, um, yeah, it was in Klamath Falls, Oregon. And, uh, the, it was a type of tournament where you casted your way into the fishing portion and it was also a, a partner tournament. So I got to meet a bunch of the big names up there, like the Ray Jeff brothers mm-hmm. and a bunch of the other guys from the Golden Gate Casting Club. And so that was pretty neat, especially for a 19 year old punk kid mm-hmm. that I was at the time. And we did make it into the fishing rounds, and there I got to know Lance Egan and Ryan Barnes a little better. Uh, I knew Lance a little bit because he uh, worked at a fly shop near my house, and he actually came and taught a fly casting lesson to the fly fishing club that I was the president of back in high school. So I'd met him once then, but didn't really know him other than that. Um, so uh, we ended up fishing against them in, in uh, that that uh, TV show. And then, uh, the next year after the guide season, when I was done and looking for some work in the fall and winter, uh, I happened to end up applying to the same fly shop that was opening up that both Lance and Ryan ended up at. (laughs) (laughs) And so we, uh, that was just really serendipity (laughs) to be honest. Um, and so, um, after working with them, they were both fly fishing team USA members. Um, by then and Lance had been on for a few years and I think Ryan got on that year. And then the next year they had a, a team USA regional and, and because I was interested in it, they both introduced me to what was fairly antiquated European nymphing methods that we had back then. Uh, so that I could kind of nymph, but still abide by the rules. So at that point, because of the, the rules and in, in tournaments, where you can't use indicators or split oh, yeah. shot, you know, added weight, that type of stuff. Then the option for our team was either you go out and you, you fish a uh, dry dropper, you know, and kind of imitate having an indicator rig, or you go out and use what we were at the time calling Polish nymphing because mm-hmm. we were being taught by Vladi Trezmunia, who's a, a Polish angler who was a former world champ. Oh. So we were using kind of his style of European nymphing, which dated back to the eighties, but most of the other teams had kind of moved on at that point. But anyway, uh, so I learned, I learned that and then kind of combined that with my background as being an indicator junkie and, uh, met in the middle, I suppose, with some of my own tactics uh, as a result. And then we had a regional and a team USA regional in Utah the next year in April hmm. And I finished just high enough at that that I made it to nationals. And, and then at uh, nationals that summer in Colorado, I finished just high enough that I made it on the team. Um, and uh, then just kind of worked my way up from there and have been at it ever since. Hmm. Wow. And that was, so you started, you were kind of around 19 years old. And how old are you now? Uh, I am 33. So that was, um, that was a couple years after. So it was 2004 when I did that OLN oh, okay. fly fishing masters tournament, and then they didn't do it the next year, or else I would have gone back and and done it again. But the the Team USA regional that I entered, and then the nationals we had that year was in 2006. So I was 21 when I made the team. Okay. Uh, so yeah, this is my 12th year of competing with uh, Team USA. Wow. So you're and you're still you're still competing and. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh wow. In fact. Uh, in three weeks we we'll leave for Italy for the world championships. No kidding. And, and so most of the world championships are, are in Europe. Is that pretty much the a case? lot of them? Yeah. Um, so, uh, let me list them off the ones I've been to real quick, just so I yeah. can have it in my mind. So, uh, Scotland, Poland, um, Italy, Slovenia, Norway, the Czech Republic, Bosnia, we had one in Colorado in 2016, hmm. and then last year was in Slovakia. This year will be in Italy, and then in 2019 it'll be in Tasmania. And I've, I've qualified for that one as well. And then, assuming I'm able to make the team again, I will be going to Finland in 2020. Wow, 
<laughs> That's awesome. So what, I mean, what do you think as far as, I mean, you've been doing this a while, what, what are the, you know, the skills that, uh, kind of got you to where you are as far as being on the, on the U S team and, you know, if somebody else wanted to eventually get there, what, what would be the most important thing? Um, well, I think you have to be a really good all around angler. Um, you certainly have to be able to Euro nymph and, and do kind of what the, the techniques that competitions are known for. But if that's the only trick you have in your bag, you're not going to make it very far. Hmm. Um, you have to be a really well-rounded angler, understand fish, understand um, their behavior in all sorts of different conditions from, you know, cold weather to warm weather to, you know, any number of environmental var- variables mm. to the species that you're fishing after. All these tiny little edges that can, you know, make a difference for you. And then you, you have to be able to read water, find the best technique for covering in covering individual water types. Cause we're limited to a beat, which may be a hundred, 150, 200 yards long for three hours. You know, your average angler is out there just chewing up water going from one pool to the next. Mm-hmm. Right. But, but we have to learn to fish any single water type that you might encounter that's in your beat hmm. and extract fish from it. So you can't just be, you know, uh, a pool specialist or a riffle specialist or a, you know, dry fly right. specialist, no specialist, whatever. You got to be able to do it all. Um, in fact, uh, one of the things I always point to, so back in 2015, uh, I won the individual bronze medal at the world championships and our team got the silver that year. And that was the first team medal we'd, we'd been able to get. And when I went back and did my journal entries for, um, the championship, I tallied up the numbers and of the, all the fish that I caught on on the rivers, 45% of them were on a dry fly. Huh. Just kind of, you know, long leader technical dry fly fishing downstream for the most part um, in really flat, you know, spooky, gin clear spring creek water. So um, it's not just a Euro, you know, game, right. which everybody uh, kind of assumes yep. when they when they think about competition. In fact, I can't tell you how many times if I if I had a hundred bucks for everybody that had said to me, oh, so you're on the national check nymphing team. <laughs> Um, right. I, I might what, have a pretty good little nest egg by this point. So what, what about, uh, what about like the wet fly fishing? Right? Do you get into that a little bit too? Um, yeah, there have been, there have been tournaments where it's come into play. In fact, in, um, in Norway, uh, in 2013, we were on a couple of rivers that were big, broad, lower gradient rivers where they were clear enough that you couldn't really approach fish very closely. So you either had to fish kind of like a dry dropper rig at distance, um, like you would an indicator, or you had to swing wet flies. And so if you had a, uh, kind of a glide type beat where it was really flat, smooth water and not very deep, uh, wet flies certainly, uh, worked there. Mm -hmm. But, um, I would say, in general, in kind of the uh, competition approach, there's not as much of that goes that goes on unless it's a really large flat river. Because instead of kind of covering broad swaths of water, like um, a wet fly uh, system does well, but not necessarily really hammering on individual locations. You know, uh, most of the time we're trying to, to cover yeah. every little inch, inch by inch by inch mm. by inch, and and uh, a euro nymphing or you know similar approach like that tends to do that a little bit better than, yeah. than, you know, the broad brush stroke approach. You know? totally. <clears throat> and that old, that old saying of whatever it is that 90, 90% of the time fish are feeding under the surface is kind of part of the deal where is that a, a big part of this? I mean, you're getting them on dries too. You said 45% of the time, but is sure. it, is it typically more like 70% nymphing? Yeah, that, that's probably a fair assessment. Um, You know, it's funny, uh, in later sessions, a lot of times it ends up becoming more of a dry fly situation than in the early sessions. Because I think in the early sessions, people go out and they just stack up fish um, using nymphing approaches. And and then as the fish get kind of hammered and used to what a lot of the competitors are doing, which is probably a fairly similar approach um, in between them in the first few sessions, then uh, a lot of the fish that are left are fish that are around the edges or that um, intentionally move to the edges where they're kind of more susceptible to dry flies. And, uh, after the, you know, the main runs and riffles and pools and the, in mm-hmm. the center of the river have been hammered, then, 
uh, later sessions, the dry fly often comes into play more than it does earlier sessions, I would say. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I want to get more into the, some of the Euro nymphing stuff and all that uh, information, but maybe you could just briefly tell us just because I, I don't totally understand like the scoring system. Maybe you can just break that out uh, kind of quickly how that all works. All right. Um, so when you show up to a competition, uh, there will be a set of venues is what they're called. It's just the, the number of rivers and lakes that you might be fishing. And at a regional for Team USA, we typically have four. And then at a championship level event like the national championships or the world championships, there'll be five. And there will be uh, two sessions a day uh, for the most part, except uh, if you have five like at nationals or whatever, then there will be two days that have two sessions and then one day that has one session. And each each uh, one of those sessions is an hour or uh, three hours long. And so the field uh, is grouped together by teams. And you have uh, at a world championship, you'll have a five man team for each of the countries. And then uh, you'll split the field um, into groups. And so one man from each country will go into a group. And then that group will rotate between all those venues. Uh, so they'll go in a certain order from river to river to lake to river to whatever. And then uh, during each session that you fish on one of those venues, you're going to be ranked top to bottom. And, and you'll get what's called a placing point. So if you're in first place, then you get one placing point. If you're in second, you get two placing points, et cetera, all the way until last place. Um, and if you don't catch any fish, then you automatically get that maximum number of points, which is the dreaded blank and will hmm. basically ruin your, your, you know, your tournament hmm. most of the time. But uh, as far as how you're ranked in each one of those sessions, uh, you get fish points for every fish that you catch. So you get 100 points for catching the fish. And then you get 20 points for every centimeter long that that fish is. And so the minimum size fish that counts most of the time is a 20 centimeter fish. And so for a 20 centimeter fish, you'll get 100 plus 20 times 20. So it'll end up being a 500 point fish because you get 100 points for catching it and then 20 points times the the length, which is also 20. So you get you know okay. that 500 point and, fish. And the but 20, if you get a longer fish, yeah. then it'll end up being more points. And for those uh, uh, not not used to the uh, you know, centimeter, what, what metric? Would, yeah, yeah. As far, what would be the, uh, that's about eight inches. About eight. Oh, okay. Yeah, the minimum. eight inches minimum. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, so then you know all those points in each of the session are tallied up. So t- uh, typically, if you catch more fish than someone else, you'll probably beat them. Mm-hmm. But if especially as the numbers get higher, um, then it's possible to beat someone, you know, with less fish than them. But if, if you have, you know, a, a couple of really big ones or just kind of a higher average size, yeah, um, the math works out, you know, more in that favor as you get higher in numbers where the differences are smaller, basically. Gotcha. But uh, generally, you're you're trying to go out and just catch as many fish as you can. Yep. However, that happens, and and so that you might employ lots of different tactics to make that happen. I might, in a lot of sessions, I might go out with four different rods and have a dry fly rod, a dry dropper rod, an nymph rod, and a streamer rod, you know, mm-hmm. and, and you might use all those. You might only use two of those, but yeah. uh, your goal is to catch as many fish as possible. So then each one of those sessions, um, you get a placing point from it, and then all those placing points at the end of the tournament are added up. Whoever has the fewest placing points uh, ends up winning the tournament, but if there's a tie in the placing points, then it goes to the fish points that are um, caught, you know, or that you added throughout the tournament. Gotcha. And that'll rank your individual scores, and then for the team score, it's just a combination of all your individual scores. Hmm. Oh, that's cool. So you mentioned that you uh, received a uh, bronze in 2015. What? What? Um, what? How did that feel? Getting a uh, be- oh, it was awesome. Yeah, yeah. In fact, um, it's funny. Uh, just this morning, I was sending off a uh, an updated bio to the publisher for my book that's coming out. Um, this next year and uh there's a little blurb about that in there and so i kind of relived it in my mind mm-hmm. for half a second and uh well, could you could you uh, take us to that moment and kind of explain well sure i mean uh, it's just like any other event where you get to watch someone on the podium and uh i think a lot of us uh, have watched you know olympians or whoever throughout yeah. our, our young lives and looked at the tv and said to yourself man i wonder what that would feel like 
And uh, for me, uh, it was amazing to get to live that, um, to, you know, hop up on that podium and watch uh, them raise the flag and, and hear the Star Spangled Banner and, and mm-hmm. uh, know that I'd, I'd done something that only one other person in our, our uh, team history at that point had done. Wow. Um, because uh, Jeff Courier was the only other uh, person to have a team or an individual medal from Team USA at that point. Um, he, he won one in 2003 back in Spain. Mm-hmm. And so we didn't have a long pedigree of, of, uh, you know, competition success, like a lot of the European countries do. And it's really only been about the last 10 years when we've gotten enough of a competitive system together that we can start to really kind of stack up with most of the other European teams. And we've come a long, long way in that regard. Mm. But before that, you know, there was only one other individual medal. And then my teammate Lance actually followed up, oh, nice. uh, that with an individual bronze the next year in Colorado as well. And we had another team medal then. Yep. So yeah, it's been a, a good couple of years for, for our team. Nice. Nice. Well, I, if we have time, I'll get back into some more uh, questions on, you know, that whole, everything you've been doing there and in, in the history, but I, I wanted to get into a little bit on your nymphing because I think, um, you know, it's definitely a hot topic and it's a good way to catch fish. I, it sounds like I'm not as familiar with it, uh, but you know, I know a lot of the you, you know techniques and things like that that we do. Some of it comes from you know what you guys are doing. So um, maybe you could just start us off a little bit. Like, explain. Can you do a little brief history of? Because I know there's you, you mentioned the Polish nymphing, the Czech nymphing, yeah. and all these different things. Like, what is? Is there kind of one general theme for Euro nymphing, or is, do you really have to separate everything out? No, there's definitely one general theme these days, um, and really the 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 general thread has been similar throughout all the years of you know different European nymphing styles. It's mainly just been the rigging that that has separated it. Hmm. Um, historically, you know, it kind of all started basically because the um, Polish nymphing, anyway, um, it dates back to when they were part of the Soviet Union and they were kind of behind the Iron Curtain and they had very little in the way of fly fishing equipment that was available to them. And like, they didn't even have fly lines, right? Mm -hmm. They they might be able to scratch up a rod somewhere (laughs) and, uh, tip it was incredibly hard to find and they are having to, you know, scrounge for hooks. And most of their fly tying was done just with, with whatever kind of materials they could find. So they tied with a lot of carpet fibers and all their weight. They would basically strip old, old phone cables and stuff to nice. get copper wire for waiting. So, you know, they had a pretty tough um, set of uh, conditions to work with and, and equipment. And so, but regardless, um, they developed this kind of style of uh, back then because they didn't have fly lines and a lot of stuff. They just basically have a fixed amount of leader or a fixed uh, you know, amount of tippet. And they might even just attach that to the end of their fly fly rod almost like a tenkara rod and next kind of came checking and thing and all you know there's a whole bunch of uh debate between lots of countries on who's responsible for what and whatnot and check nymphing really wasn't that much different than polish nymphing other than maybe slightly longer leaders and they often had fly line out the tip of the rod hmm. but they still fish two or three uh, pretty heavily weighted flies and, and they would make short casts and, and lead their flies through the current and essentially just kind of watch the tip of their fly line for the take. Um, but, uh, then in, right around 2003, I think in that Spanish, um, world championship was when the French leader made its debut. And that's really kind of when things got going. If you ask me, hmm. uh, as far as what, real european nymphing truly is um and so the french came around uh with really exceptionally long leaders like you know well back then before they had a maximum leader length rule they were fishing 40 50 foot wow. leaders and uh basically only having leader out out the, through their guides and out their rod um and uh similar tactics but the they also introduced what we refer to as a cider which is basically just colored monofilament that gets added to, added to your leader and that monofilament uh, becomes your nymphing's version of a strike indicator that you can mm-hmm. watch and will indicate your takes for you and uh, so they they just 
destroyed everybody that year in 2003. <laughs> and uh, they were doing so well that then the Czech team had people hiding in the grass, <laughs> trying to watch what the French competitors were doing and everything. And really within a couple of years, um, that style with that type of rigging spread like wildfire. And the Spaniards kind of came up with their own version, which bas- basically was the same other than they used even finer leaders, like exceptionally fine. Um, and w- which, uh, provides even better connection to your flies with almost no sag in the leader because there's so little mass. But in general, um, what you're trying to get with European nymphing for the most part is a solid connection to your flies from the minute your flies hit the water and a very long light leader that, that uh, reduces the amount of sag that gravity has on the leader so mm-hmm. that you have a tighter, better connection to your flies so that you can you know, have better strike detection, but can also manipulate them uh, better and keep them at distance. So, you know, a lot of people have claimed, oh, well, we started tight line nymphing and the Europeans just stole it from yeah. us. But, um, yeah. you know, and, and who's to say where uh, any of this happens? It's, it's not like any of this is rocket science. I no. think a lot of people have come up with similar ideas in different places through the years and, and yep. have arrived, you know, with a lot of similar totally. ideas, but just different execution. Right. But one thing I will say that is very different about most European nymphing styles versus the typical tight line indicator list style, which a lot of Americans practice is just that length and the diameter of the leader. Most of the European leaders are much longer and much finer than a typical tight line leader that you would find in the United States. And so because of that, they can fish them off of the water, but much further away. So you can space yourself away from fish more. You you don't have to approach quite as closely and you can fish it in many more water types. It doesn't just have to be heavy pocket water or, Hmm. you know, runs and riffles where it hides you, but you can fish it in pools, even in some flats, um, in a lot, a lot more water than, just a traditional tight line approach with a short leader. Right. So, and that's something that I'm pretty familiar with. I mean, so how might you, you know, with the Euro style, you know, with the really long leaders, how might you fish something, I guess, if you're making a really long cast and stay on top of your fly, you know, I know if you're in close, it's, you know, it's easy because you, you're got the detection, but so are you making really, are they, you know, making really long casts and really long? No. Um, but, you can fish 20 to 30 feet maximum okay. away from you. Uh, but a lot of times with a, a pure tight line system, you can barely fish beyond the tip of your rod because the, the line sags back towards your rod tip so much that if you try and make a longer cast, it just brings your rig across the current yep. towards you and, and you can't keep it in the seam that you're trying to fish it in. You know, if you make a longer cast, unless you lay your fly line on the water, but then you lose your connection, you That's know? Right. And, and all that mass in the fly line and the leader also deadens your strike detection because it takes a lot more of a reaction from the fish and holding on to that fly longer for it to actually show up your line. Whereas with a much thinner European leader and the thinner you go, the less uh, of, of a, re- a reaction from the fish it takes to indicate a strike for you. That's right. So can you break down, you know, typically if somebody was here, you know, in the U.S. and had never done it before, what a typical... Maybe, maybe if they want to go out and try something similar, how, how they would set up like their terminal tackle, their leader, the rod, and kind of just set that up. And maybe they could, they have some stuff already they can use. Yeah. Um, so there's, I mean, there's enough momentum with this in the U S now there's probably, there's a lot of options out there even with pre-made leaders. But, uh, what I normally try and start people with is, kind of a, a thicker version of a European nymphing leader just because it bridges the gap and helps them um, kind of merge and move over toward it without as much casting difficulty. Um, the thinner you go, the harder it gets to cast. So you, you want to kind of ease your way into it. Uh, so I would say start with a leader that has a flat butt section of like Maxima Chameleon um, for because it's a stiff material which will transfer energy well, but um, that, and that way you can fish a thinner butt section and still not have as much sag. Mm -hmm. So, uh, maybe a 10 to 12 foot butt section of just flat 
20 or 15 pound uh, maximum chameleon. Then take about three feet of amnesia. Um, I like the, the green amnesia. Uh, you can use either 10 or 12 pound test amnesia for that. And then uh, add about 18 to 20 inches of bicolor cider mater- material. So there's lots of companies out there that are now making indicator mono, um, which is a, a, they're, it's essentially just really bright colored monofilament. And they offer it in lots of different colors. Most of them, the most popular kind, are alternate, alternating between like orange, yellow, orange, yellow, or red, yellow, red, yellow. Uh, so there's Cortland that makes a great indicator mono uh, and, and a bunch of other companies mm-hmm. as well. And so I would take some indicator mono for, for that leader and add to it that's somewhere in the neighborhood of like 10 to 12 thousandths of an inch thick. And then on the end of that, you just add a tippet ring and for you know a lot more people are familiar with tippet rings now than than uh maybe they were um a couple of years ago but uh, it's just basically a small steel ring that that's um you can put on the end of that cider and uh um you can tie your tippet straight to that tippet ring and so on the end of that that ring that's uh, that's kind of your basic leader and then mm-hmm. you're just going to choose the amount of tippet based on the the water that you're fishing, uh, you know, depth and speed, just like you would with any other nymph rig. Um, and I would say one thing I've learned recently is, um, after fishing with, uh, people like Julian, uh, Dagoyans, who's a, a former French world champion, uh, and others is to fish as short a tippet as you can get away with and still get in the depth zone that you want, because you know, that the shorter the tippet you, you can, uh, fish the, the less slack you'll have built up in the leader, the less tippet you'll have below the water, and the better drift and better strike detection you're going to get. So, uh, typically, you know, with the and the, but the only problem is with the thicker version of the leader, you tend to have to fish a little bit more tippet than with a really thin uh, style, just to still get your flies in the same water because of that extra sag. So, I mean, most of the time, people with that basic leader, if they're fishing a, a medium-sized river with you know, in between like a foot and three, four feet deep. You might have uh, two and a half to three and a half feet to your first fly and then uh, another 20 inches to your second fly. Mm-hmm. And most of the time we tie um, our, well, all competitors tie their their flies on dropper tags. And mm-hmm. that way you can make lots of changes and only have to make one one uh, uh, not change instead of multiples to to switch out that top fly, but also it's actually required as part mm-hmm. of the rules. Mm-hmm. And is there, if somebody wanted to see this whole, uh, leader set up, is there a place that, you know, online somebody can go to and take a look at, at this? Yeah. Um, well, let me back up for just a second. So we have two videos on European nymphing now that have become really popular. <clears throat> um, that, uh, my, my teammate Lance Egan and I did along with our filmmaker Gilbert Rowley. And so, Honestly, if you want to figure out anything about European nymphing, I would I would point you to those first. So they're called uh, Modern Nymphing European Inspired Techniques, as well as Modern Nymphing Elevated Beyond the Basics, which is the second one we released this spring. Okay. And so you can find those on my website, tacticalflyfisher.com, uh, the DVD versions. And then there's also digital download versions on Vimeo. So if you okay. hop, hop on Vimeo... Um, and just search modern nymphing. It should bring you to both of those, those videos and, there. And is this so, a, um, and that's just like a, a paid Vimeo sort of download. Yeah. So if you, if you buy the, per, the, the Vimeo version, it's just registered to your account and you can download it or stream it whenever okay. you want. Um, so anyway, those two videos will get you a hardcore breakdown of all of this, including all the rigging and all that. Um, if you go on YouTube, um, there's an, there's a segment from our first video, um, on Gilbert Rowley's YouTube channel. And it's all, it has, uh, the section on building leaders in there. Oh, okay. So if you just want a, a quick little yep. kind of introductory, how do I build this leader? Then you can see it in video format on Gilbert Rowley's YouTube channel. If you just went and Perfect. searched, uh, European nymphing leaders there. Perfect. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll leave links to all everything you talked about here at uh, wetflyswing.com slash 43. 
I'll have um, yeah, I'll put some links out to your uh, DVDs and as as well as uh, as well as those YouTube videos. That's that's good stuff. Yeah, it's it's nice to it's good to talk about, but sometimes actually seeing it is makes it a little bit easier. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's why I think it's important to have both the both the visual and the audio or text components of of all these things because we all learn differently, and some sometimes one little thing here or there will all of a sudden make it click. Exactly. Know? Exactly. Cool. So. So that should, yeah, I mean, I have a a number of different questions on that, but I think probably by taking a look at some of these videos, I think probably people can, can figure it out if they're, if they're new to it. The, as far as the tippet ring, so the advantage of that over just doing a a blood knot or whatever other type of knot, what what is the big advantage there at the tippet ring? A couple. Um, Number one, you can leave your same cider on for a long time because you're not chewing back All right. um, portions of that cider with every new knot. But the other issue is um, we fish the same diameter tippet from that ring all the way down to your fly so that you only have thin tippet going below the surface of the water because one of the things we break down in the video is that <clears throat> you know that underwater environment is very dynamic, and what you see on the surface doesn't necessarily mean that that's what's down below. And typically you're your upper part of your your tippet that's near the surface is going to be in water that's faster than what's below. So if you have a much thicker leader or tippet that's extending under the surface of the water, uh, <clears throat> it's going to catch a lot of drag. It's going to basically be like a kite up there yeah. in that upper portion of the water. And so instead, we'll we'll use you know flat level tippet all the way from that tippet ring down to your flies, and so that you have less drag and you can have uh, better sink rate, you know, all those things. So most of the time we're fishing five or six X or seven X, uh, to that tippet ring. But I don't know if you've ever tried to connect, you know, six X to, uh, yep. uh, <laughs> leader that's a size bigger than O X yep. that becomes a problem. And so having that tippet ring there makes it so you can, uh, yep. connect leader and tippet of very different diameters oh, cool. without having a strength issue. That makes sense. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. The original tie right is a long-standing accessory loved by fly fishermen for decades. It's an accessory you won't live without. After you try it, no more drop flies or hooked fingers. Uh, If you haven't seen this yet, this is pretty simple. It looks like a little pin and has a retractable clip that holds your hook so you can more easily tie on your fly. Finishing the knot is kind of like spinning spaghetti on a fork, um, if you like that analogy. All parts are manufactured and assembled in the USA with a 100% lifetime guarantee. Um, You know, I think about this, like you're on the river, it's a cold November day, you're freezing, you're struggling to put on that little size 18 BWO. Um, And um, the tie right is a good example of something that's going to help you. It's like your fingers are kind of like little frozen fish sticks, but you know, when you have the tie right, it just makes it a lot easier to get that thing tied on because it, it really stabilizes the fly and helps um, to, to spin it and get it in uh, position. Um, this is a great tool from a great company, so I'm excited to share the tie right and uh, have them as a sponsor. Uh, head over to tyright.com and make handling flies a snap. That's uh, ty-rite.com to get ready today. We are also brought to you by Ascent Fly Fishing. Um, do you ever struggle at times to know which fly to put on the end of your tippet? It, maybe you, if you had an entomologist next to you, you would have a, a better idea of what was going on in the stream. That's exactly what Ascent uh, Fly Fishing does for you. And they're not just a one-trick pony from you know certain rivers in Colorado. These guys cover everything from you know Deschutes over to Colorado, Lake Run Browns in New York, um, and all over the country. So. No matter where you are, they have something to cover your needs. Uh, maybe you're heading to a new stream and not sure what to use. Uh, the boxes they have are a crazy value, a lot lower price than some other places that you might get them. And so it's just a good example. I've actually got a box myself, a custom selection for uh, one of my local streams, and I was pretty impressed with uh, the selection of flies from a lot of flies that I definitely do not have and haven't tied um, up to some of the common ones and they're just beautiful patterns. Um, you get some cool stickers, uh, just all around a cool deal. So if you get a chance, head over to ascentflyfishing.com and grab your fly selection today. 
That's A-S-C-E-N-T flyfishing.com. Okay, back to the show. So, uh, yeah, I want to get back to some of these, uh, some tips and other stuff, but maybe you could talk, I mean, you've fished all around the world. Is there, as far as the U S I'm not sure what, what state you're in now, but do you have kind of a, a home river now that you fish when you come back? Oh yeah. So I, I live in Utah. Um, we just moved back here this spring while my wife's going back to school and I took the business on full time, but I've lived all over the yeah. Western United States in okay. the last 10 years. Um, but my home river here is the Provo. Okay. So that's uh, between like 15 minutes to 45 minutes from me, depending upon the, the stretch that you go. Oh, cool. To, so that's kind of my home river. Um, it's known as uh, Techie Tailwater, and uh, it's fun to uh, go revisit a lot of the same stretches of river that I fished, you know, with indicator rigs as, yep. as a youth, and uh, revisit it with urine nymphing and and see the kind of success and the different places you can catch Definitely. fish that I wasn't historically able to. Uh, do you still, and I think is the, the Provo, I think, or the fly fish food, uh, guys over there too. Is that, is that I think that might be their, their yeah. So yeah. they live in, they're out of Orem. Uh, and that's actually who Lance works for as well. Oh, okay. Nice. Nice. So, uh, yeah, I have them actually, I think, uh, gosh, I got, they're coming on here and I, uh, Let's see. Well, no, I guess now I guess I'm looking back. They've already, I've got a few of these already scheduled out. So yeah, they've already been on. I just don't have that episode right in front of me, but uh, I could probably find it quick enough. Yes. Episode uh, 40. So I had, uh, yeah, we had a good chat about uh, fly tying and some of the, the, their stuff. But um, so yeah, they, they, we talked a little bit about the Provo River there and fishing it, but maybe you can just break down you know, as far as if somebody's going out there and wanted to do some of the tactics you've been talking about here, how they might get into fish, is there anything we missed or some tips you might give them to get into a few more fish there? Well, I don't think the Provo is really much different than a lot of places as far as what works. Um, I mean, if you have a solid technique and solid presentation, you're going to catch fish. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the Provo is known more as uh, a bit of a small fly tailwater fishery. Um the, the funny thing about that is that as you start to European nymph, um, you know, we'll, we'll occasionally fish some flies in 18s and 20s and things like that. But a lot of the time we're living in like the 16 to 12 type size range mm-hmm. and everybody thinks that those don't have a place on the Provo, but I can assure you that they do. Um, and it's interesting to see just how much difference a proper presentation makes over imitation down to the you know color size yeah. whatever um that's one thing that will show you just how much of an effect you know the presentation has versus the, the pattern because mm-hmm. uh there will be lots of times uh, like yesterday i was out there fishing and, and there was some water that was quite quite deep quite fast and i needed a fair bit of weight and i f- put on a fly that's called the sexy waltz worm and all it is is hairs are on a hook with some you know, pearl ribbing through it and a little hot spot up front. Mm-hmm. It looks like absolutely nothing in the river. It's very much a, a, pink a general, spot. yeah, pink hot spot up front. <clears throat> and, uh, and it, I mean, it, it literally looks like nothing. And it was a size 10 or 12 that I had on with a pretty big bead. And, uh, that fly all day long was very successful. And I took a couple pump samples just to reference, um, in comparison throughout the day. And most of the fish either had in the morning, they had, you know, little midge pupa and black fly larva or midge larva. And then in the afternoon, you know, PMDs and some caddis were hatching. And so they had some of those in them and almost, you know, nothing in a pump sample was over about a size 16 or 18. And yet here I was catching plenty of fish on a much larger fly that looked absolutely nothing like what was in the drift or what they were eating. Um, So Mm -hmm. while at times, you know, fishing quote unquote the right fly or the fly that imitates you know such and such um can make a difference especially during a really heavy hatch most of the time i consider that to be a bit of a crutch where uh Mm -hmm. we we anglers like to give ourselves an excuse for when we're not really catching very many fish and it's probably our approach that's the issue and not necessarily the fly we're fishing Mm. so so probably the most important thing might be just your i mean I guess I was going to ask that earlier about your casting and the ability to be a good caster on the U S team. But do you think just it's like you said at the start, it's more being an all around fisherman, being able to present that fly correctly is, mm-hmm. is probably the most important thing. Well, 
you know, first step is you got to know where the fish are, which, uh, in teaching a lot of anglers, that's a yeah. very, and maybe you can break that's that a out. big issue. Maybe you can break that out quickly. Just as far as reading water, a, a little glimpse of somebody, maybe a tip or two on how, you know, they come to a new river, how they might quickly read the water and find some fish. Sure. Well, um, and that's one of the things we cover in the second video is understanding where fish hold based on water temperature, especially. Because it's going to change a lot throughout the year, depending upon the metabolism of the trout, the the water type they're in, and the hatch um, progression, and how many bugs are in the drift or not. But, I mean, most people are, uh, if you go to the Provo, I would say 80% of the people that you'll find fishing, they're fishing some really obvious run or pool that if you looked at the river and said, oh, where were fish going to be? Everybody points to that (laughs) because everybody understands that a big pool or a run is going to hold fish, right? But the, and because of that, because it's a really popular river and it's right by a metro area, half the time you can't even find one of those that doesn't have somebody else in it on a busy day, right? So really the the key to the Provo for me is learning to fish all the in-between water and reading where fish hold in the in-between water um, because especially as a European nymphor, instead of an indicator nymphor, you can hit a lot of that pocket water, those shallow riffles, the, you know, hard, hard bends with eddies and big, you know, boiling stuff that's very difficult to cover with an indicator and you can be really successful. And so um, learning to, you know, read water is a process of trial and error for all of us. Uh, so I guess if you're new to all of this uh, and to fly fishing in general, you know, fish lots of different water types in front of you, but mainly look for anywhere within the river that offers just a little bit of respite from heavy currents. You know, even in the middle of a raging rapid, you can have fish there as long as you have uh, a boulders. boulder or a, or a depression or something that changes the current speed down near the bottom of the river mm-hmm. and allows a fish to hold there. And that's the other issue is that it, just because what you you see looks very fast on the top of the river doesn't necessarily mean that it is on the bottom because especially when you have large substrate, large rocks, and and a lot of depth changes um, around all that substrate, you have lots of friction with that, and uh, you're going to get you know a lot of different areas of slowdown. Uh, and wherever you're going to have rocks, larger cobbles, think of it this way. One of the things I always like to point out: uh, most people when they go and look at a river they can see obvious areas on the bank that have eddies wherever you have a rock that you know sticks out from the bank you get that pressure wave on the front the current diverts around it and then you have a recirculating eddy uh, downstream of it well the same thing happens in the middle of the river it's just flipped vertically and so um, you know you have a horizontal eddy on the edge but if you put a rock on the bottom of the river the same thing happens Uh, that current gets shunted over the top of that rock and then there's that vacuum on the downstream edge of that rock, and you basically get a vertical eddy that forms in the mm-hmm. middle of the river. And so, um, you know, those areas all hold fish, and learning to identify, you know, what depth and speed will hold fish throughout the year, I think, is the hardest part for a lot of people because they have success in one area of the river on their first or second, you know, visit to the river. And they expect that's where the fish are going to be every single time after that. But as the conditions and the flows and the, the water temperature, the hatches, whatever changes, uh, there may be, there might not be, you know, very many fish there the next time. Um, yeah. so I'd say that's one of the hardest skills for most anglers to, it is. to develop and, because it also hinges on you having a good presentation and all those water types where you can actually tell whether there's fish there or not. Exactly. So just because you fish there and you think, oh, well, I didn't catch any fish there, that means there's not any fish there. Yep. Well, that isn't necessarily the case, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's just, a, it's, you know, that's one of those skills that is developed after many, many, many years on the water. And I would say the best way for someone to learn it is to, um, you know, go with someone who's better than them, who really is good at that, and they can just watch and learn from yeah. Yeah. I was kind of thinking I was just on the river this last week and I was swinging flies, you know, just downstream and across. And, and that's a pretty effective way, whether you're steelhead or trout, to, you know, covering the water 
and it's pretty easy to do, you know, I mean, you're just kind of swinging it so you can, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, you can cover the water and as soon as you get a tip or a tap or something, you're like, okay, there's a fish, then you can stay on that fish and you probably found one of those little spots. And, uh, so that's a good way, but with nymphing, is it, I mean, I guess that that is the challenge because if you don't know exactly what you're doing, you're not getting your fly down in the right spot, then you might've just missed that bucket. Um, yeah, well, and, and the other thing that I, um, that becomes really challenging there, especially in, I, I find this wherever you have hard seams where it goes from slow to fast really quickly, whether it's pocket water or a you know, a run that, uh, the edges are much different in speed than, than the center or something. Mm-hmm. A lot of people think they've covered something really well, but I can't tell you how many people, people that I've guided or taught and they make 10 casts and they might finally get one that actually goes in the spot that I'm trying to get them to go to. Yep. And, and so they think they've covered the spot really well and they want to move on, but they haven't actually showed their flies to the, the fish that are in there more than once. And then on that one, they might've had a poor drift. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so, especially in those types of, of water, you have to be very aware of where your flies land, not necessarily where anything else on your rigs land, because that's not really what's important. It's where your flies land. So you got to watch the plop of your flies and understand, okay, my flies landed there. Now, where are they drifting as a result of that? And am I drifting them well? And if you, if you can't track from your cider down to your flies on that leader, <clears throat> you're not really going to predict very well where your flies are, are at. And so those are kind of acquired skills over time where you learn to predict where your flies are at because of how your cider is drifting and how your, you know, the speed it's going, the angle and all that. And then what, what angle, uh, you can extrapolate to the position of where your flies at. <clears throat> and based on that, you can really learn whether you've covered a, a certain piece of water well um but that's a that's a hard skill there's a there's so much there's so many details and small you know minutia that that really set to you know take someone from being good to being exceptional and those are a lot of things that actually do that in my mind totally totally i always uh kind of joke about it sometimes saying you know if you have a snorkel and a mask and you want to jump in the river if you know you could see you could sometimes you could take a look and see some of those structures or you know see the fish that's always a a fun thing if you if you want to go for that sort of extreme level but um yeah i was going to check in um i had a few more questions here but uh before we i think we have a little more time on just getting a few more tips i wanted to check with you to see if you had i was thinking at the beginning you mentioned that you know, you barely made the, I think of the regional team and you kind of barely made it in there and you got your foot, you know, and you basically made the team. What do you think if you wouldn't have made that team that first round, um, you know, what would have been your process and and you guide now, right? So, are so you, I, yeah, are you I, I filled all my dates for 2018 and after 2018, I'm kind of stepping away from it. Um, oh, really? my, yeah, the shop has gotten busy enough that every, every time, I, I guide, I end up getting buried. So it's, it's eating into my own fishing and training time. And so, oh, uh, wow. uh, yeah, so yeah, this is my, my last official year for now. Uh, okay. that may and, change down and, the road, but, and what is your now in the shop? So you, you have a shop or maybe you could uh, clarify what you have. It's, it, well, we have a website that's fly shop at tactical fly yep. uh, It's actually run out of our house. So yep. one of our rooms upstairs I'm, that I'm sitting in right now, I'm surrounded by inventory from wall to wall, Oh wow! <laughs> but but yeah, so I, I, I run, we run that, that shop, um, and, uh, it's kind of focused on a lot of these competitive techniques. So we have a lot of, uh, both tying and fishing type equipment that is really geared into getting someone exactly what they need in this. I mean, it's all the type of stuff that I, really, I built the shop off of things that I use sure. and that I, that I like, and, and then it's expanded from there, um. And so that's where I started and it's, you know, had a, had a momentum and a mind of its own over the last few years, especially uh-huh. since the, uh, the videos came out. Oh, cool. Cool. So you, so you basically have you with focus on, I guess, like we were talking about the, the Euro nymphing stuff, but it, are most of the products there? Do you have a, a, a wide variety of different products or is it all pretty focused? Oh, uh, it's, uh, you know, especially tying wise, we have a very wide variety, um, <clears throat> uh, but really, uh, if you want to get into tying any like uh, competition-inspired nymphs or streamers or you know a few dry flies, things like that, we've got anything and everything that you would want pretty much for for that style. And I have a bunch of YouTube tutorials on my site that 
that'll show you some of my confidence flies and how to tie them and with you know links and stuff of uh, how to buy them okay. but in addition we have lots and lots of uh, european nymphing rods and and gear associated with that and you know lines and leaders and everything yep so you got it all uh, okay mm-hmm. and, and what, then we yeah in the future we'll probably be expanding into some of the lake fishing side of things too because that's a big part of what we do in the competitive scene as well um so oh, really? far i've been space limited so i've slowly been adding that but uh down the road i'll probably have a bigger presence there oh cool yeah i had uh, uh phil roley on in episode 34 and uh we talked about some Stillwater stuff uh, yeah from a past episode uh, so i haven't had a ton of i hope to eventually get into more of the the still water and some of that but i haven't had a ton of guests on yet um but that's cool yeah so you guys are kind of covering your bases and then expanding a little bit what what is the typical just for you know we're talking about rivers here the provo or whatever typical river would what, what length and what size rod would you use for this well most people consider the 10 foot or 10 and a half foot three weight to be like the nine foot five weight of your own thing <laughs> okay so you know if everybody if you go and you want to buy a, a trout rod for fly fishing at most fly shops they're going to hand you a nine foot five weight well yep. if you want to get into the euro nymphing you're going to probably want a 10 foot or a 10 and a half foot three weight um yep. and we have lots of other you know lengths and weights as well uh that are kind of for unique situations or just types of rivers where you might want might want lighter or longer or whatever um but in general if you're going to go and learn how to urine and get a 10 10 foot or a 10 and a half a three weight okay and oh and a three weight and not not mm-hmm. a not a uh, not a four weight or five weight three weights nope year. so the the thing uh that we're looking for in urine and is uh, number one a soft tip at least a softer tip that uh will cushion um strikes because you have such a tight connection to fish that uh most stouter rods if you set the hook on them you're going to be breaking off a lot of fish um it's different than when you have all sorts of slack on the water like you would with you know most other methods um and a lot of line out that provides a lot of stretch you know you have a shorter presentation that that uh connects you to fish so you don't want a real stout rod but the other thing um that you need is that soft that soft tip for and the length for is to be able to cast really light rigs so you don't have a fly line at the tip of your rod that's loading your rod like a, a normal you know fly fishing scenario is mainly the weight of your flies and your leader that's actually going to load the rod and so if you have a very stout rod it becomes harder to load it now you can still do it i've, I've actually fit urine for steelhead lots of times with a with a 10 foot seven or eight weight but it takes getting used to and being comfortable with with, with uh, the casts that are associated, and it's easier to do that with a, a lighter rod. Um, but the other thing is too that uh, when you have that ten or ten and a half foot three weight, it's almost like taking a nine foot five weight and then just extending the taper for another foot foot and a half. It's you know if you were to talk to a rod designer, they'd probably smack me in the face for saying that <laughs> because I'm sure it's more involved than that. But really, if you look at the power associated with the rod and the fighting ability and all that, because of that extra length, you're getting a lot of the properties of power and and leverage and fish fighting uh, capability that you would have with a shorter, heavier line weight. But then you get those delicacy and and tipper-protecting properties of that three weight, plus the extra length for the reach and the casting properties. So Hmm. you get a a really um, a lot of benefits from having that, uh, that longer, lighter rod. Nice, nice. I, yeah, as happens a lot in, in this uh, this show, I I always have a lot, way too many questions. So I we'll, we'll see how I, I it goes here right towards the end. But I might have to check back and have you come on in a, another time if we can figure it out. Sure. But, uh, yeah, I just want to maybe we'll kind of do a little bit of a rapid fire thing as we kind of uh, go through here. One one quick question I had I, I've uh, interviewed and we talked a lot about Spay. The first thirty two episodes of this uh, podcast were all about steelhead. Uh, focused on steelhead fishing and I've moved into kind of season two, which is all trout now. But um, I mean, what about the spay game? The whole trout spay thing is kind of, kind of growing in, in the, in fly fishing. Is that something you think has a place with uh, what you're doing here with the, the, the Euro niffing? Oh, I'm certainly not opposed to it. Um, there again, going back to what I said earlier, when it comes to the competition scene, um, you're wanting maximal, fish caught from us usually a fairly small amount of water and so 
Um, I mean, and I, right. I spay fished, I spay fished lots. Yeah. Uh, you know, I lived in Oregon for two and a half years oh, cool. and in the fall I would, yep. all I did was swing for steelhead and then, you know, I'd have my, my swinging rod and then I'd have my trout rod and I'd, I'd go out and I'd nymph and for trout and I'd swing for steelhead just for fun. Cause, cause I wanted to swing for steelhead. Right. Yep. So I, I have you know no opposition to it whatsoever. I did it a lot myself, but as the temperatures would come down and the fish were less grabby, um, and they moved into smaller rivers then I usually turned to nymphing for the steelhead and, and it was more appropriate for that water and that, that time of year, that temperature. Yep. Um, and I think the same kind of goes for, for the trout spay. Uh, it's, it's really good at covering lots of water and it's a really kind of fun, uh, way to do it. Um, it, it, uh, it, it really, it's polar opposites in that, um, you can, kind of just check out mentally and just enjoy the rhythm of the cast, yeah. the swing, the cast, the swing, the step, yeah. you know, cast, swing, step. And that's yeah. really enjoyable at times. If you, that's what you're, you wanting, your nymphing is kind of the other side where if you want, you know, commando style, aggressive tactics where you're picking a, the river apart piece by piece by piece by inch by inch, and you're catching a ton of fish out of a short amount of water, then that's where your nymphing excels. And, yep. um, so they, you know, that's the great thing about fly fishing is, and the reason why we have so many disciplines is that there's lots of ways to catch fish, lots of ways to enjoy your time out there. And I, I'm not going to tell anybody that they have to do yep. one or the other. It's that's about right. how you enjoy your time. But certainly if you're going to, uh, want to, you know, either up your catch rate or get into the competitive side of things, then you definitely need to become a pretty proficient Euro nipper. Yep. Um, cause it's certainly important in that game. Okay. Okay. And, uh, so you mentioned a couple of flies earlier. If you had to pick your top, uh, two or three flies for, for nymphing, what, what would you throw on there? Boy, I don't know if I could do two or three, but I do hmm. have, uh, I think we have seven that are our confidence flies in this oh, okay. first film. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, that's, that's hard, but, yep. um, so if I, let me just name off a few off the top of my head. So, um, Peridigones are a Spanish style fly that has become really popular in the competitive scene. They're, they're essentially just a, a very slim bodied, hard bodied fly with no legs or anything to, you know, slow your sink rate. And uh, they've become a big part of my arsenal. So I have two of those, uh, patterns coming out with Umqua next year. that are kind of one of my, in my confidence okay. patterns. So one is called the quill de gone, which is a quill bodied, uh, Peridigone and the other one's called a light bright Peridigone, which is the body is made out of crystal flash. So those two patterns, that, the Peridigone, how do you, the P E R D I G O N. Okay. And it actually translates to pel- uh, pellet in Spanish mm. from what I've been told by the competitors over there. And so essentially your fly sinks like a pellet. That's, that's the goal. Okay. Uh, so those would be two patterns that are really important to me. I have all sorts of variations in colors and you know, whatever that I use of those. Uh, another fly, you know, besides that hair's ear and pheasant tail variations are usually very important. So mm-hmm. when it comes to those, a Frenchie or just, uh, some other sort of really basic pheasant tail is very effective. Um, and, uh, uh, one of my core confidence patterns, uh, a soft tackle carrot is another one. It's, it's a hair's ear that's ribbed with an orange rib and has a CDC hackle. Hmm. It's a really good kind of all around summer pattern and also very good when you have caddis pupa that are in the water. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you could add a, a waltz worm to that and you can tie waltz worms and waltz worm is just that dubbing on the hook again. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really basic. You can, it, it can be imitative when there's sow bugs or something in the water and you can tie, you know, real basic, just hairs around a hook and brush the legs out to look like sow bugs, but it also just looks like everything and nothing at the same time and works very well in most rivers. Mm-hmm. Um, squirmy wormies, uh, you know, good old junk fly. Th- those can be really good at times. Um, and that's, and a, that's like, a, like a pink, uh, almost like a San Juan worm type of thing. Yeah. It's like a, it's a San Juan worm, but made out of extruded rubber. Oh yeah. And so, uh, it wiggles a lot more than the San Juan worm does. And if you, if you fish them both back to back, the squirmy will basically kick the pants off oh, the really? one worm every single time. <laughs> yeah. I've never had a situation where I fished them both and the squirmy wasn't better. Yeah. Um, so it's very effective. Um, it's one of those flies that, you know, people sometimes have to break down their own barriers to fish because, uh, you know, we all have our kind of 
uh, crossing the line point where we figure we're fishing a fly or not a fly or whatever. And early on in my uh, competitive career, I kind of poo pooed it like a lot of other people do because it's labeled a junk fly, you know. That, yep. That, uh, but after you fish it a few times and you have some success on it, you'll you'll fish it again. Um, uh, and then other than that, like a rubber leg stone fly, that's always yeah. a you know an important one to have. So there's lots of you know lots of the core confidence type patterns that we would have in any any nymphing put a tungsten bead on them and occasionally maybe a few wraps of lead and you've mm-hmm. got a euro nymphing fly so okay. are pretty much all the euro nymphing flies have some a decent amount of weight on them well almost all of them will have tungsten beads mm-hmm. and then if you really need a heavy heavy bomb of some sort then you might have a shank full of lead as well when do you do you ever fish a non-tungsten bead um, yes, but not, not really your own thing. Okay. Um, maybe I would for, I will, you know, with, uh, kind of like a midge and a midge pupa dropper situation or, uh, really, really shallow flats where I'm sight fishing and I just want a brass bead or mm-hmm. something. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, in a year on nymphing situation, if you're not fishing tungsten beads, you're probably wasting your time because in, in the end your flies are your split shot. Yeah, when you're, that's you're right. Nymphing. And uh, so, if you're fishing unweighted flies or something, you're you're basically just wasting your time. That's um, right. That's right. And that's you big, yeah. you you need to be able to change your flies to different amounts of weight, just like you would change your split shot if you were indicator fishing. You know? and, and that's because there's no you can't use split shot in competitive fishing. Uh, correct. Um, you certainly can if you want to do a sort of a hybrid system, but um, in my own experimentation, just you know, for the heck of it, uh, I still have a lot more confidence in having the weighted flies than I do something like a drop shot system or just split shot and some unweighted flies, even with the same leader. Yeah. Um, uh, the properties of, of the strike detection and the drift, um, I've had a lot more success with it. Yep. Yeah. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, so as far as uh, gear, do you have a uh, kind of a non fly fishing piece of gear that is like your must have thing you have out there, whether that's, you know, whatever it is just in life? <laughs> oh, well, that, boy, that's in Pandora's box. But yeah. if I'm on the water, if I'm on the water, um, besides my fly fishing gear, I usually have my, uh, my very expensive camera with me. Oh, okay. <laughs> yep. So, you, so, yeah. So I, ha- I have a, a waterproof sling pack that it goes in. And then, so I have a Sony a seven R three that, uh, goes around with me and takes my still shots and gotcha. And so that, that's probably my, my non fly fishing okay. uh, piece of equipment. That's always on the water with me. Perfect. And you can see some of uh, those. Do you have an Instagram? Do you, do you put, yeah. So yeah. you can find me on Instagram, uh, at tactical fly fisher. Okay. And, Perfect. and I'm on fa- Facebook there as well. What's, um, as far as a resource, uh, that's like for your nymphing, that's not your, your, your own stuff. Is there anything you would recommend somebody else, other good stuff that's out there? Uh, I mean, if you, uh, you know, I think kind of the breakthrough book was dynamic nymphing from George Daniel. Mm-hmm. Um, that was the first book that gave a better treatment of, of your nymphing styles. And, uh, I'm trying to remember Dynamic, dynamic nymphing came out probably in about 2010 or 2011 if i remember right and with the way now that i have my own understanding of how book writing goes a lot of that book is written a year and a half or two years beforehand so mm-hmm. so george finished that about the time that he was done with team usa when uh we crossed over as oh. both being members uh, on the team oh, yeah. at, at about that time and so he was you know some of the french style nymphing that we were just becoming you know more acquainted with and better with made it into the book but uh uh, so it was a really good first treatment um but there's been a lot of additional things that uh, have come about since then so i mean um i don't know uh as far as the urine thing goes i've tried to fill that niche a lot with with lance and so our videos and a lot of my blog posts and things are are good Mm -hmm. places to turn for that okay but there and there's also uh there's no, no, not a whole lot of other material that's dedicated specifically to it out there, but you can find some um, kind of portions of books like uh, Nymphing Masters by Jason Randall that, that touch on it. Uh, but, uh, you know, really, I, I guess, not to sound arrogant, um, but um, 
it's the competitors that have really kind of yeah. specialized in this that are probably the best source of, to turn to for a lot of this material. And so um, we've tried to provide that that material between Lance and I, and we probably have some of you know the best material out there if you're wanting to learn this either sure. either between our videos or or uh, the blog posts. And I'll also have a book that should be debuting in January next year as oh, well. That's cool. Kind of all about competitive styles of fishing, not just your own nymphing, but also just how to break down the river in front of you and fish it kind of like a competitor would. Perfect, perfect. Do you have a title for that book? Yeah, it's uh, tactical fly fishing's uh, or tactical tactical fly fishing lessons learned from competition for all anglers. Okay, all right. Yeah, I guess they can just find that again. Go to your site at next year. Or be out there. Yeah, it'll be. It should oh, be. Well, out I guess. January, yeah, so. somebody might be listening to this now and. 2020 and you know <laughs> who knows how long this is going to be out there but uh sure so, so. it'll be january two, 2019 okay so. <laughs> cool yeah, yeah um what about a rod right now is there a rod i had somebody ask me the other day about you know costs and stuff i mean can you get a rod for under a hundred dollars it's a, a decent uh euro uh, kind of a niffing uh not under a hundred bucks um there are a few euro rods out there that i know of that are in like the mid hundreds range okay um, they're, they're decent and that's just uh, having that action yeah i don't have any of them on my site um mainly because they do tend to be heavier and slower but yeah uh most of the better year well most of the introductory euro rods start at around 250 bucks to 300 bucks okay um the hard thing about a European nymphing rod, because of the extra length, it's hard for a company to cut corners and go to really cheap materials and still have a rod that functions very well because it will end up being very heavy yeah. uh, and recover really slow. So even some of the rod models that are in the introductory range certainly pale in comparison to you know some of the premium models. And because as you get longer, those issues are magnified. So... You know, a lot of people might take a two hundred or three hundred dollar nine foot five weight and compare it to a eight hundred dollar nine foot five weight, and if they're not, you know, versed in fly rods, they sure. might think, oh, well, what's really the big difference? Yep. But most people who pick up two euro rods, one that's you know an introductory model, and one that's a premium model, and they give them a hard shake and you show them how to flex it, they'll be able to tell there's a pretty big difference just because it's pretty hard to build that really high functioning you know rod yeah. at a at a cheap level, you know, that's 10, 10 and a half, 11 feet long. Right. Um, so, I mean, you are looking at maybe a little bit more cost to get into a Euro specific rod. Um, I will say this, you can certainly go out and try it with your sure. nine foot five weight or four weight. Um, but do that with the knowledge that you're handicapped. Yep. So don't go out there and think, Oh, well this doesn't work. I'm yeah. not going to do it again. And a big part um, of that is on the being the just the sensitive sensitivity of feeling the takes and things like that. Yeah, but a lot of times you're looking for takes. You're not. Uh, oh, I right. always tell people if, if they're waiting to feel the take, they've probably already missed it. Sure. Um, so if you're not seeing it first, then you're waiting too long. So um, so what is the biggest advantage you get of the of the premium rods then over the, the lower? Well. Rod? I, like uh, premium as rods, you're you know you're going to have a much lighter rod. It's going to balance with um, a lighter reel, so you're going to be able to fish that all day long and have a lot less fatigue because mm-hmm. you're also fishing in a position with your arm extended and probably your shoulder raised a little bit. And if you have a, a full package that's pretty heavy, then it's going to be harder to do all day long than than it is with you know a lighter rod. Uh, so there's that. You also get a rod that has a lot faster recovery. So Many of the less expensive Euro rods, especially as you break into like the above 10 and a half foot length where it gets magnified even more. So like if you take an 11 footer, that's, you know, a less expensive rod, you'll make the cast and, you know, you make your back cast and you're coming forward on your back cast and your tip is still going back as you're coming forward oh, because right. that co- recovery is so slow. And then sure. when you make your forward cast, you stopped your cast and then your tip takes forever to get there and then recover to a you know, a, a neutral position. And so your, your casting accuracy is compromised. And, uh, I just, uh, and because that's such a really important part of your nymphing, being able to get your flies into that, you know, four inch wide seam, then, uh, having a, a really quickly recovering rod that, that, uh, balances back to that neutral position and dampens well, makes a much better fishing tool. That's more accurate. Um, and then you also can set the hook quicker 
uh, and react to strikes quicker when you have less swing weight in the rod and most of your premium rods have a lot less swing weight uh, and balance with that that lighter reel better so uh, that's really what you're getting by moving to the top but there's a lot of euro rods that are good in that you know mid-range as well that are worth looking at yeah okay cool no that makes sense well oh i have I have a, a a bunch of other questions. We'll have to leave these uh, till next time. I just want to check, um, you know, with you maybe in the next six months to a year, if there's something we can keep other than the book you mentioned is coming out. Anything else that uh, we can expect from you that's coming up? Well, um, I'll be at some of the shows uh, that are out there coming up. Uh, definitely, I'll probably be in Denver and New Jersey this next year at the Fly Fishing Show. Okay, and uh, I'll be at the Utah. Wasatch Expo in April. Uh, I'm doing a little bit of travel to a few other clubs around the country too, so I'll be doing some things like that. Um, cool. But mainly, as I uh, as I back off the guiding next year, I'll hopefully have more time to dedicate to the blog again, as that's uh, been harder to keep up regularly now that the the site and uh, the bit the guiding has kept me busy. Sure. But also, it'll give me some more time to. You know, have my own fishing. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I guess that is the goal, right? We want to be able to do some of our own stuff out there. And you, and, uh, do you have? I, I can't remember if you have uh, kids out there. Or... Yeah, yeah. No, I've got I've got two little kids. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, totally. Mm-hmm. Yep. So you're in that yeah. that whole thing too. Yeah. So you I am. Yeah. yeah. You want to have some time with the family, and you know, the fly fishing is great to have it as a, a you know as your you know way of making income, but definitely time with the family is good as well. Well, thankfully, I can at least to a certain extent uh, combine them. So. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> cool. So, and uh, what uh, if people want to find you and or like some of your things coming up? They could just uh, go to your website. Is that the best place? Yeah, it's a good place. Uh, tacticalflyfisher dot com is my website, and I have lots of lots of articles there on the blog that you can go back through and read. Um, we also have both of the DVDs available for sale there, and if if you uh, can't for some reason find the the video on vimeo i have links to the specific locations for the both of the videos okay. if you go into the product the, the product description for both of the modern nymphing videos there's a link for the vimeo version as well all right that you can click on um and then you know shop around on the site yeah perfect perfect well uh yeah i just want to thank you for coming on and uh, sharing the tips and you know the background on the euro nymphing this is the first time i've really dug into it with anybody so i think it, it gives me a good idea of some different things i can do next time i'm out, out nymphing so i just yeah i want to thank you for uh, sharing your wisdom yeah no problem dave thanks right. for having me on and maybe we'll do it again yeah yeah if, uh, a little more detail or something exactly when i say i'm not sure where i'm going with like seasons three four and all that but uh yeah i've definitely got a few people just a handful that i want to come back on and so yeah i'll check back with you for sure all righty all right have a good one you too dave all right see ya so there you go if you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered uh, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 43 and please head over to itunes or uh, to wetflyswing.com slash subscribe and uh, and subscribe to the podcast this is the fastest way that uh, i know of to help uh, get the show out to other people so thanks again for doing that Uh, And thanks for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon and hope to see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. 